Hello and welcome to the Build a Soil YouTube series. This is season three, episode seven. And today we've got a pretty big episode. We're gonna cover a lot of content. So if this is something you're interested in, I, I think it's gonna generate some questions. I'm gonna cover the basics and I have a tool that you can use when you're going over your soil testing to make it easy. I'm also gonna show you that you don't really need soil testing. You can just follow the build a soil way. We're gonna highlight that through the rest of this grow. In the 30 gallon containers, you're gonna see one admitted the build a soil way, where if I just didn't have a soil test, it's what I would do. And we're also gonna do one where we go very specific to the soil test and talk about what we're gonna add. I'm gonna show you how I add it. Some of the micronutrients will be put in water first and we'll water them in. Some of the other things will be top dressed. Right away, one of the biggest differences that you'll notice is the build a soil way covers a lot of the bases from the soil testing without knowing whether we're precise or not. And I'll mention a few reasons why I think that you can do either way. No matter what, you still have to read the plan. So you'll get better at this over time. The build a soil way is going to utilize many different ways of accomplishing the same result. Soil testing might be more precise, but in mixed soil that we're making, it may not have as much hang time. And that's why I don't recommend fully trusting it. It's a great way to get a snapshot, but there's some reasons We'll discuss that it may not be a perfect situation when it comes to soil testing, but there's also some equal reasons on why it can save you if you're loaded in sodium or something that's just so easy to find out. It's worthwhile. On a commercial level, it's very, very worthwhile. From a home grower's perspective, it's most advantageous when you're sourcing random stuff around your area to save money, and you wanna know, is this worth it? Can I make a really good soil with these ingredients? You can test the ingredients by themselves. You can grow a plant in it and see the, how the plant does, but at the end of the day, you want to get down to the math. You can get a book by Steve Solomon, The Intelligent Gardener. You can get The Ideal Soil by Astera. I've had long conversations with both of these people about the soil testing and the processes. There's been tons of information updated uh, since those have been published from within the community specific to the types of soils that we're using. And we'll address some of those subjects as well. But right away, when we go to Logan Labs, we get a soil test that looks like this. And we run two tests on it. We run a regular, what's called a malic three, and it's a strong acid, it dissolves the soil, and it tells us what's in the savings account. It tells us everything that's in the soil the plant could ever access if it had superpowers, like if it could just break the rocks down, eat all of the nutrients out of it. But we know plants aren't like that. It takes a team of biology, exudates from the roots, and the plant mining the soil, so to speak. And so we also do another test that's called a saturated paste test. That shows us what's water soluble. Uh, more likely what the plant can see the day you plant into it. When I'm balancing a soil that I've mixed from scratch, I think that's super important to look at. But for your backyard soil and for potting soil when it comes to amendments, a lot of times we're gonna use the regular soil tests to actually make calculations on how to amend it. So that's what we're gonna do today. I've got a spreadsheet that will generate a report like this and I'm gonna talk about it. All you do is you go to buildasoil.com, you go to the blog section, and you'll notice one of our more recent blog posts it talks about our soil test calculator. This is version 1.54. We'll be updating it as we go with user comments, all sorts of stuff, but it's open source and it's free. When you're done, it literally tells you what to add and it tells you pounds per acre and it also tells you grams per cubic yard. Today, we're only gonna be doing 30 gallons, which is less than a cubic yard. So I'm gonna help you with one basic formula that will show you how to convert from grams per cubic yard down to whatever size container you have, be it one cubic foot, 30 gallons like we're doing or whatever. If you have questions, you can always message us. We'll help you. Here is where our soil is at in blue. And you can see that once we have added the uh, green, that's where we'll be to. Once we followed this recipe, like the selenium was a little bit high, that's based on kind of an arbitrary amount that should be there. We'll talk about some of those basics, but the most important stuff on here, we're gonna address. Like, is the sodium too high? Is my calcium too low? Those are the kind of the biggies that we'll talk about. We also have this 2022 Build a Soil feed schedule available for download. And if you go to buildasoil.com and go under the education tab at the top, this is on the growing system. And at the bottom, you can download this file. There's some instructional information. And it's the fundamental principles. On here is all of the grow room environment stuff that we discuss at detail in the 10 by 10 series. And instead of taking notes along the whole way and guessing what I do, because it's really spread out. We do lots of episodes. You can just see each week what I set things to. And although I may not follow this perfectly, this is my ideal. And so that's what I put on here. So you can do the best you can with your environment. I talked briefly about drying and all the things are contained in here. So check that out. And I think it'll help you. If you've got feedback, let us know. This is the Taken Bank. 
And I'm not gonna do this one. I decided I'm just gonna do the build a soil way on the take and bake. I don't like adding all these micronutrient sulfates. I went way down the rabbit hole in soil testing. We did with hemp farms and vegetable farms and outdoor soil and mixed media, which is what these, these are, you know, compost, rock dust, peat moss. And I've just found that they're not 100% necessary, especially for somebody who's growing in a grow tent, right? So we're gonna really make sure we discuss that. But since we're talking soil testing, this one had a lot higher phosphorus, 1,977 pounds per acre, almost excessive. And that was from some of the amending and the phosphorus can kind of linger for longer. And this was from the last round. So I'm not gonna add any more and I'm just gonna do the build a soil way. But I wanted to mention what can happen when you're doing soil testing and adding stuff. It doesn't always add up perfect. And the phosphorus isn't excessively high. In fact, a lot of growers wanna be in that really high range. But I think that it's a little bit higher than you would see if you just followed the build a soil way, where it's a little bit like less is more, if that makes sense. So there's that one. Let's actually get into the 30 gallon right now. This is what we're going to be doing. You'll notice that we have this Malik 3. We also have what's called AA 8.2, amino acetate 8.2. It's, it's for alkaline soil. The reason why we do it in a potting soil is we've recently added lime or calcium to the soil. And when you do that, it can create a false reading on cation exchange and a false reading on the volume of calcium that's in the soil. We want to address that. So in the soil testing books, they say if you've got alkaline soil, which you can do a fizz test with vinegar, if it fizzes, it's alkaline. You want to ask for the alkaline test. If you've recently applied lime, it's helpful to run both these tests and then you can read the between the two. So that's what we do. And it's not totally necessary, but it does make a difference. The calcium on the regular test shows 3466. Well, we recently added calcium. We know that that's not right. And so we run the 8.2 and it only comes in at 1476. And that's not good. It's a big difference there. So what we do when we run a soil test is we take only the calcium from the 8.2 Everything else from the Malik 3, we combine the two, we recalculate the cation exchange, and that tells us how many of what to add. And that might sound complicated, but I tell you, the free spreadsheet that we have and the books that you can read, they tell it to you all. And when you get this spreadsheet, you literally take this, and if you notice, they're in order. So right here at the top, it says the pH, organic matter, sulfur, phosphorus. That's what it does. pH, organic matter, sulfur, phosphorus, calcium, literally in order. You just follow it. You type in the results, it says up here, notice, right? Potting soil testing use calcium from AA 8.2 test only. All other numbers from the M3 are standard. So we remind you on here, okay? And then also 7.7, .7, please use all the data from the 8.2. And so we talk about if you're alkaline, outdoor soil, how to use that data. If there's some good feedback on this and you guys are like nerding out, we'll do a whole whiteboard where I literally go like, hand math on all these formulas that are contained in the spreadsheet and talk about when you may or may not use certain amendments and how they combine and we can get weird on it. But if that's too far for you, the spreadsheet literally does all the work. You type in the numbers and then only thing that you have to do, once you type in the numbers, it spits out what you need. And on the spreadsheet, it makes a lot of sense. But when I print it out, I have to show you page by page. So the first page will be your nitrogen and it'll literally tell you how many of which one of these amendments to add all of them will be displayed. Since I chose the Neiman Karanja seed, it's, and I put the pound that I was gonna add, it said zero is left. The reason why that's great is, maybe you wanna do half of this and half of the other. So you start at the left side and you literally add whatever you want, and it'll tell you how much of which am amendment is remaining that you could add to get to your target amount. So it's that simple, you put your numbers in, you type in whatever amendment you're gonna use so that the numbers match and it zeroes out, and that means you're done. Then you go on to the next one. This is the phosphorus. And when you click the phosphorus tab, it gives you our only two options. We have fish bone meal and calphos. We'll be extending and adding to this. Some people use bone meal. There's another phosphorus product that we're about to use here at Build a Soil for our soil recipes. And we'll be adding that in this list as well. Um, but for now, these are the two. And there was no recommendation for phosphorus in this one. So that was easy. So next I, I clicked on potassium. And that brought up the numbers for potassium. And it was easiest to add potassium sulfate. Kelp meal is also used, but it's gonna balance kelp meal against the level of sodium that's in the soil. I could have used either or or a combination of both. Uh, then we have calcium and we went with the oyster shell flour since the pH was a little low, we could definitely use something that would boost it. A lot of times I'll use gypsum, but the sulfur was already high. I put that in there and it zeroed everything else out and we're good to go. Last is all the micronutrients. You can use big six if you want, it's a product from us, or you can individually go through and add all your favorite micronutrients, which it's not my favorite thing to do, but you can literally put in the exact amount and then it's gonna tell you what it applies to the soil.
and it'll add it to your report when you're done. So that's the basic walkthrough. Bottom line is that's the report that it spit out and that's what we're gonna do today. We created this tool because it was something that we needed internally. We were doing lots of soil tests and you're literally doing the same formulas over and over and over. And so I like automation, I like spreadsheets. I knew that if we made it slightly prettier and it made it more functional, more people would use it. They get the benefit from it. It might get them the bug to learn more about it. And so we created it about two years ago and it just kind of sat there. It was for free download online. And I'd made this final version, and I never updated it, nor did I give the password away. So if you wanna download it, the password is 777. It unlocks the spreadsheet to make it open source. You can access all the formulas, you can change the ingredients, add to it, expand upon it, change the logo out, I don't care. This is just free information from Build a Soil. And it publishes a report that you can print out with a couple of graphs on it. If it's something that you have questions on, post them up. Let's get started with the recipe, because that's really what's next to do. And then when I get into the tent, I'll show you what I do for the Build a Soil way which is if you don't have all the soil testing. I've got a little less than a gallon of water because if I put more than that, it's going to flood the container that I pour this into and I'm gonna have to put all the water in. The other reason why we use water is it's hard to put like a gram of powder evenly across 30 gallons of soil or more. When you put it into the water, we make sure that it gets fully into that soil and now the plants can use it. Part of the reasons why I don't particularly like this method is that it's based on the cation exchange and it's not perfect, especially in a mixed media. And if I put the micronutrients in there and we have 59% organic matter, which is say over 10 times the normal amount in a regular garden soil, it's gonna complex a lot of those micronutrients. It's gonna make it harder to be as directly translatable as a regular agronomic soil like out in your backyard. And because of that, you're probably gonna have to supplement these same micronutrients throughout the grow. And you can't just load them all up front because they're pretty water soluble, they're sulfates. And that becomes a problem. So the build a soil way is we use similar micronutrients, but they're chelated via humic acid. And you can apply all at once via the water since we know that even if you balance it perfect, they're gonna to start to use some over the first couple of weeks and then you'd have to do another soil test to find the perfect balance. So what we kind of focus on is providing a sufficient amount. And when you foliar spray or when you water in something of normal amounts, a little bit more routinely uh, following our build a soil feeding schedule, then the plants are gonna receive the benefit and you're less likely to overdo it because it's that less is more. To me, um, Kevin from RootWise, he gave me this analogy and I really like it. When you're growing in living soil and you have to have something that's slow release for a while and it may be not perfect, but you're adding it, it's like starting a fire. You don't wanna just burn it all on the first day, all the wood's gone and all the energy's dissipated. You kind of want to go put one log at a time and it just keep that fire roaring evenly. Don't let it burn out. Don't let it just be wasteful. And I think with micronutrients, high organic matter potting soil, that's what we've come to find to be true. And same with soil testing. What if I scooped in this part of the container and not that part, or I mixed it improperly, or I got a little bit too much of the mulch, like the three by three had a big mulch layer on it. It's probably that high in phosphorus because we applied a lot of it to the surface. And so I could be getting an incorrect reading partially why I want to follow the build a soil way. I know we put in there. I know it's not that high, but when you just take a scoop at the lab, the scoop is like this big. It's ridiculous. And here's the other thing. They based that scoop off of an average weight of 2 million pounds per acre at six inches deep, which is regular soil. Some of it's sandy, some of it's clay. So even the regular weight in your soil in the backyard varies but they take an average. And that might be fine for your backyard because it's closer to the average. A good, healthy, organic farm is like three to 8% organic matter. Well, this is 59%. And then you think, okay, two million pounds, six inches deep. Well, what's this way? It was 807 cubic yards, 806.7, I think. Six inches deep across one acre. 807 yards, let's do some calculations real quick. So we take two million pounds Right, And we divide it by 807 cubic yards, which is how we mix soil, by the cubic yard. Well, that'd be 2,478. Let's just say 2,500 pounds per cubic yard of soil. Well, our soil, before you add all the water to it, probably weighs 600 to 1,000 pounds on the heaviest recipe. So let's just call it 1,000, wet. Well, that's a lot less than 2,500 pounds. So how are we applying pounds per acre to something that is nowhere near the same pounds in that acre? That's where it gets weird. They have a soil test number on here. It's called estimated nitrogen release. When we calculate in the report, on the front page of our report, it actually has a place where you put it in there. So when you put your organic matter in, it's gonna multiply that times one for estimated nitrogen release. When you do a regular soil test, they estimate a lot higher. In fact, it probably says on here, ENR, estimated nitrogen release down here, 130 pounds per acre it says on here. I don't think I'm gonna get 130 pounds per acre of nitrogen out of that potting soil, even though it's that high in organic matter. It doesn't correlate the same. So I'm gonna say it's gonna do a one for one. 
the organic matter is about 60%. I'll probably get 60 pounds of uh, nitrogen out of there. The worms really help give nitrogen to the plants pretty quickly from their exudes and the organic matter. I mean, it does happen for sure, but the plant's growing along the way. I don't think you're gonna overshoot the nitrogen while the plant's growing. This is kind of like a factory of making it on demand. So to get the soil to sufficiency to start, I shoot for 100 pounds per acre of nitrogen. Some farmers use 200. By cutting it in half, we get more flexibility with genetics and we account for that estimated nitrogen release. Again, I didn't wanna to go too far on it, but for those of you that are experts, I just want you to know we calculated everything in the spreadsheet that we could that made sense to calculate so that you could use that information, okay? The build a soil way works, other ways work, and I think the reason why the build a soil way works is we know kind of after a while from soil testing that, hey, sodium can build up if you're just throwing all the same amendments, or potassium can build up if you're not balancing the phosphorus and calcium. So what we've learned from that, we've put into the recommendations we make through all these series that don't have the soil testing. So take it from us, all the stuff we're recommending is based on a lot of data and experience, but you don't have to go that far to find out for yourselves. Ask your friends, watch all these videos, and react to how your plants are responding, and that's really the best way. So here is the report. And I'm just going to go in order. It says neem or karanja meal, 1,115 pounds. I'm reading upside down. Um, and that's per acre. But grams per cubic yard, it does the math to 627.27 grams. And since we're doing 30 gallons, I'm going to do one more calculation. And I'll just write it down on here. I'm going to take the number that's on here, which is 627.27. 627. I'm just going to use the round number, 627. Okay. And we're going to divide by 27. That gives us cubic feet because this is cubic yard. There's 27 cubic feet in a yard. One cubic foot is about seven and a half gallons. So remember that, okay? So divide by 27 and that's what it equals. So for each cubic foot, I'd be adding 23.22 grams. Well, in a 30 gallon container, I've got four cubic feet. So I'm going to multiply times four. That's my number, 92.88 grams. You don't have to be so exact, but since the formula's there, we can be exact. I'm just gonna do 92 grams. You can always add more later, okay? It's hard to take out once you've done it. So 92. Next, the seed meal that I'm gonna use. Let's talk about that real quick, and then I'm gonna start adding stuff into here. We're gonna use 92 grams. That is a 411 seed meal. I know that because that's earlier in the page when you're applying for nitrogen. That's mainly what that is for. I've got a new product that's the same NPK, which means I can totally interchange it for the Neiman Karanja and it has some secondary benefits, which I'm loosely going to discuss, and you're going to see more content about our observations as we learn more about this because it's new to us. We found this white paper, and it was from a long time ago. I wish I'd seen it sooner. A lot of times the answer you're looking for already exists. You just have to align yourself with it, ask the right questions, and they show up. I started typing in questions because the world record pumpkin grower uses mustard seed. Um, he grows the seed on his acreage before he puts the pumpkin out because it biofumigates the soil. I was thinking about fungus gnats. Turns out the effectiveness of defatted mustard meals used to control fungus gnats, it's pretty potent. And in here, there's some juicy details. I'll let you just look that up and you can read it, okay? Make your own conclusions. But I'll tell you what I've done so far, what we've seen here internally, and let me see if I can find the one page. So in this report on page seven, there's a lot more information, but you can see the toxicity of the Brassica juncaea mustard meal, a specific one, to fungus gnat larvae as determined by the numbers of emerged adults. And so there's different types on here, but the Junkea, they did at 1%, 3%, 6%. At 1%, it killed some of them. At 3%, there was literally no fungus gnat adults emerging at all. And at 6%, same result happened. Now we can't just go hard on it because it's a fertilizer. So 6% would be a lot. And we mainly want it to get to the fertility benefits. If it helps clean the soil, that's great. One of the big issues with growing in organic soil is that compost and amendments and decay, it attracts fungus gnats. If they weren't there to start with, it's a great home. Sometimes they come in the compost and we don't sterilize compost. So seasonality, it can be sometimes more or less. This can be a tool for us internally to use. We're gonna add it close to that amount. I'm not gonna jump in full steam ahead, but you can because you can top dress with it and it has the same effect. You don't have to mix it completely in. Now, I'm not selling it because it has that effect. It's a great seed meal. That's what we use it for. But when I bought it and I added it to the worm bin, we noticed all the fungus gnats were gone. And I'm reading this paper and I'm thinking, this could be a huge benefit if it's true. We've got a local lab that would love to extract the active sulfosinegrin glucosinolate. That's the active compound in this particular mustard that does the job. The other mustard were much lower. It didn't have that one. So that's what we know is doing the job. If we can extract it, make a product, we'll talk about it. But this meal is perfect for a no-till grower. This is what it looks like. It's a mustard seed meal. It's ground up mustard seed. And when you put it on top of the soil, 
um, you just literally work enough to just cover the top of the soil with a light top dress. And when we put it in our worm bin here, we had one worm that died, so be careful. It was on top of the mulch, didn't have a chance. Everything underneath the mulch where all of the worms were, they dug straight down. And within the next day, there was more worms than I'd seen, white pillows of mycelium, I think growing healthy because anything that was out competing them in the soil had been fumigated by the mustard. And there was more importantly, not one gnat flying out of the worm bin anymore, row of beetles abundant, worms literally on top working inside this mycelial mat. So we'll talk about that more on another episode where I get deeper into it. But because I'm switching it up today and I'm not using the neem karanja, I wanted to address what this mustard meal it is. You're gonna see me put it in there and I'm gonna try and put it on every container in there all at once so that we get everything at once and I can really say for sure whether this works or not. So we'll get there. I'll leave that at 92 grams. I'll weigh it out so we know how much is there and we'll make a decision when we get inside the tent. Uh, for this one though, I'm gonna at least have 92 grams weighed out. For the other ones, it's whatever I wanna do, right? So let's go to the next one. Potassium sulfate. That one I can put in the water. Um, all the rest I can put in the water. I don't have to put the t potassium sulfate. It's enough, I can probably spread it. The oyster shell flour, I'm for sure gonna spread. But all the rest, I'm probably just going to add into the water. In fact, might as well just put the potassium in there too. So let's start there. Potassium sulfate. Let me read it this way so I make sure I get it right. It says to put 159 pounds per acre or 89.84 grams per cubic yard. Let's do that same math real quick. I'm going to divide by 27. That gets me down to the cubic foot. And then we have times it by four to get four cubic feet or 30 gallons. And we're at 13.33. I might as well just do all the math on these so that I can just go faster. And the Montana Grow Silica, one of my favorite products. We add it to our soil already. Uh, pounds per acre is only 60. I think you can add a lot more than that. And that's part of what's a little bit silly. You can not overdo the silica, the Montana Grow. So don't worry about that too much. We're gonna do five grams. If you could totally do more than that, that's part of why it's fun to know what you're doing. You can make up your own as you go. Let's just go down the list now, add it to the water, and we finally get to go in the grow rooms. I've got this plastic one that I'll use for the larger ingredients. Potassium sulfate. Here it is. And this is potassium and sulfur. All these are approved for organic use, 13 grams. All right, I'm just gonna use this because that's obviously not very much. It's for a 30 gallon container, so it makes sense, but there's the potassium sulfate. Put it in the water. Got some J Plant speaker, Q Yaha. I use this all the time. You know what it is if you watch along. It's just a little wetting agent. It might suspend stuff in water a little bit better. So I'm gonna put just a tiny bit in there. That'll foam up the water and keep it in suspension and help spread it through the soil when I water all these in. Let's go next in order. Oyster, I'm gonna add that by hand. Boron, so we've got 1.3 grams of the boron. I went and grabbed a smaller scale because this only goes to the gram and it's not as accurate. Okay, and 1.3, so add that in here. Now you can clean it each time, but I mean, it's all going in there, I'm fine with it. It's a little bit of what I already weighed. So I'm just gonna put that back on, it still says zero. It's a very, very small amount. So manganese sulfate, nine grams. Next, we have copper sulfate. We want to do 2.3 grams. 2.3. I'll stir it several times and make sure that it all gets in there when I go dump the water in. All right, the zinc sulfate, 3.3. Cobalt is next, so a gram of cobalt. And so here's the cobalt. It's from Unicorn Productions. They've got a mine. We buy right from them. Cobalt. Okay, so sodium molybidate, 0.4 grams. Geez, like none of that. We sell these little bags, they last forever, so you don't need much of this. That's the good thing, right? The soil testing, even Steve Solomon says, hey, look it, you're getting ready for the end of the world, you just need a couple little bags of minerals around. Very, very specific, that's part of the benefit. That's everything, that's all we're gonna add in here. Once I'm done pouring this in there, I'm going to then top dress the oyster shell and the mustard and the I think I'm just gonna do straight mustard for all of that. But if you're watching this and you're wondering what the build a soil way looks like, real quickly, you can see a few ingredients over here. This is the micronutrients, the big six. We've got another way to do micronutrients, it's seawater. This is the C90, it's basically a sea salt. It tastes salty, you don't wanna get salt in the soil. So we would just foliar spray and get nature's balanced level of micronutrients. Obviously soil has micronutrients in it as well. There's different plants that grow better in different regions. So we're not trying to make it seem that simple, but the Jadam farming, a lot of other organic farmers, they're just gonna use a sea salt instead of all these sulfates. They're gonna foliar spray it to make sure that the plant has access to what it needs instead of trying to get it perfect in the soil. And then Craftland. Craftlands are all purpose, uh, just all around general organic fertilizer. And you can look online, see our new label, see the NPK that's on it. I think it's a 352. So it's got a little bit more phosphorus. 
that three by three bed, I'm not gonna be adding this. It's got tons of phosphorus. So I'll take a look at that soil test. I'll do whatever I want on that to build a soil well and we'll talk about it. The 30 gallon, I'm gonna use some craft blend on because that's what I would do in the 30 gallon had I not had the soil test. And we've done that one to build a soil away the whole time. So it could use a little phosphorus. I'll show you exactly what we're gonna do when we get in the grow room. To make it easier, I'm just gonna bring the exact amount and then I'll bring that in there with me. So. Okay, 95, that's fine, it's a seed meal. I want enough to cover the whole surface of the soil. I would probably do a little bit more than that to get the reaction that I'm after. And I know that it's just gonna be a little bit high. I think I'm gonna exhaust that, that 30 gallon anyways, as far as nitrogen goes. And this was only to 100 pounds per acre. So I can safely do it just a tiny bit more, make sure I get that coverage that I'm looking for. 140, okay, so I went, I went higher. I just really wanna make sure that this works, so. Oyster shell flour, top dressing, we're gonna need 81 grams. Okay. And then we're gonna need five grams of the Montana Grog. You can go hard on this stuff, let's see. Okay, that's all I'm supposed to add. I love soil testing, but like, yeah. The earth is made of silica, like it's fine. So I'm gonna go a little bit harder. That's how much I wanna add in there. Okay, so we added, we added like 90 grams of Montana grow. It's fine, it's rock dust. You can go hard on the rock dust, okay? I've got all the stuff that I'm gonna top dress to the top of the soil. It's not much stuff. And then I've got the liquid. Let's go do that 30 gallon in there real quick. This is the one that was tested. That's the 30 gallon that we're supposed to amend. You can see I've got cover crop in here and that's what I normally do if I have downtime between cycles. This will also be some of the fertilizer that we're adding back in as far as green manure. Now, since it's young and tender, it just breaks so easily and it returns to the soil so easily. So I'm gonna do a little bit of this. I'm gonna like mash it. Here's the stalk from the last round. I mean, literally it just completely breaks down. You can see there's all the roots from the last time and I'm gonna be planting right in there. I don't really need this in here and I'm gonna to wanna to get this even and amended. So I'm gonna take that out, set it in that one for now. I'm not trying to rip the roots out, so I'm holding it with my hands and trying to like just break it down instead of completely rip it out of the soil, if that makes sense. And there's a fungus net or two. They have kind of lingered around. We've never had any real problems with it in here, but at home, if you really mess up, they can be a nightmare. And so instead of just trying to say, hey, you gotta be perfect, I'm really hoping that this does its job. Okay, that's good enough. The rest I'm gonna wiggle in here as far as the dry amendments, but I'd also like to get the liquid in there. So I'm just gonna pour that in, make sure that that's all stirred. Foamy from the cute Yaha. I'm gonna evenly apply this, but since it's three layers and it's not mixed, I'm just gonna go like that real fast and then back again to try and get it all. Mustard meal, I really wanna get everywhere in there, around the crevices. So I wanna go around the edges. I wanna get everything covered with that mustard meal. Okay, that's it. Now I need to get this wiggled into the soil, not just up on the mulch like this. So I'm gonna do a little bit of action with my hands. This mustard is gonna start releasing as soon as it hits that moisture. Just wiggling it into the top, like into the soil to make sure that we get some soil contact with those amendments. I'm gonna come back around and hit this up with some moisture so that it gets all around the edges here and really does its job. But that's it. That's the full soil test on a 30 gallon, which might seem insane, but people do it. It works really well. You're gonna see the results from it. This one in particular is just gonna be the build a soil way. You're gonna see these grow next to each other. Not the exact same clone, but same genetics. But I think you'll be able to borrow from this and say, hey, I can do it either way and it'll work really well. Right now I'm gonna break this down and get ready so I can go grab the mustard meal and the craft blend and just tell you what I'm gonna do on this container versus what I did over there. So here's the stock. I can break some of this up. This cover crop didn't grow as much as the one back there because it had no grow light over here. It just kind of off to the side, but it still did something and it's still adding some green manure in here. I added mustard in this one already a little bit. Look around the side here. That's the microbial matting that I was talking about that gets created wherever you put this stuff. All right, cool, that's ready. Now over here, this cover crop's a lot healthier. You can see all the way down in here, there is the straw that we put in before down to the soil surface. And so I'm gonna mash this down and kind of break it up. And this is gonna be part of the fertilizer this round. Some of it's still gonna grow, but by the time we're done with that mustard, and everything else we're gonna be adding in here for the build a soil way. I expect a lot of this to be turned into plant food. The rest will be part of the mulch layer. 
and we're not going to plant in here tomorrow. We got to get the DNA results. We're going to let this come together, warm up a bit, myceliate. Then we're going to plant into it. So I've got a little time. The mustard meal says wait three weeks. That's because it can be a little hard on small plants. It has some of those potent biological activities that can be a little strong on the plant. One of the mustards has a water soluble compound. One of the glucosinolates that's a little bit hard on plants, a little phytotoxic. But I think our transplants are going to do well. And either way, we're going to learn. Again, I'm not trying to rip all the roots out because I don't want to disturb the soil that much. Some of the younger ones, it's fine, but these big ones, it'll be a problem. So I'm more breaking them down. So let's see if there's anything going on. Wow, it's like worm castings in there. And there's worms all up in it right there. It's exactly what we want to see. They're going to love what we're doing right now. They're just going to be feasting on all this stuff. Okay, now I've got stalks in here. See that? But I don't need to remove it because we don't have to plant in the same spot in this bed. It's big. We can just plant in another spot and that way we don't disturb the soil at all. And we leave that as microbe food. This is now on top of all the browns, right? That's why we do the straw, browns and greens. It's gonna make compost once the worms work it. It constantly regenerates. Some people say you don't need cover crop indoors. You don't need it, but it's a huge part of the build of soil away. It tills the soil so we don't have to throw it away. The worms work the process. It fertilizes. And we're truly using it like cover crop when we do it in between cycles like this. When we grow with our plant, it's more of like a living mulch or a companion plant. But right now we're doing cover cropping and we're getting it fed back to the soil. Let's grab the rest of the amendments that I want to use for the build a soil way. The micronutrients, all those sulfates we added, we're not going to do any of that. We're going to foliar spray either the seawater or we're going to add a little bit of big six into the watering as we go. I don't need to add it right now. And that's part of the benefit of doing it the other way. All right, I grabbed the mustard meal. I grabbed the craft blend. Craft blend's already got the Montana grow in it. And so this is everything. And I'm just gonna put it in this container. This is the one that we did in soil test. And then I'm gonna put the mustard on it. And that's all I'm gonna put over here. A lot of times when I re-amend, I'll be adding more compost, like more of the Colorado Worm Company castings or build a flower. I can do that later. And this cover crop and the worms, like they're so active, it's not fresh soil. I don't think I need to add any brand new compost to this or any new worm castings. And if I want to, that stuff's gentle. I can add it later. Right now I'm going to add the amendments into here and make sure they just get into the soil. Then I'm going to water it in and that's all I'm going to do today. On the actual schedule, it tells you the top how to set up your soil. Solo prep, minimum 15 gallons, craft blend, a quarter cup per plant. Okay. I'm re-amending the soil. And so I'm going to add the full half cup in here. Just one of these half cups. I can always come back and add more later, so I don't need to go like crazy with it. But you can see it's pretty even layer. That's it. I've got the mustard meals. There's one half cup. I'm just gonna go around the edge with that one. The gnats and stuff can kind of like just work their way around the edges and go down like as deep as they want there where the soil contact is. So that's why I'm handling that. And I'll do one more half cup. That's it. That's what we're doing in this bed. Micronutrients, I can foliar spray, I can water in big six. I can always come back later and add a little compost. The last thing I wanna do on this is I'm actually gonna water this all in so that it creates that moisture connection to all of the amendments where the biology can start working on it and then it can really do its job. So craft blend, I don't need to add to this one. This one already had really high phosphorus. All it really needed was, I think it just needed some calcium and it needed some nitrogen. I'm gonna grab the soil test and I'll just show you what I'm gonna do without doing any math on it. Just look at it, see what it needs and go after it. So just looking at it, it's really high in phosphorus. I don't need any. Magnesium's tiny bit low, but there'll be some of that in whatever I add, potassium. So realistically, that's the main one. I'm just gonna go straight mustard on it. All right, let's go around the edges with the first half cup. We're still learning a lot about this. So as you get it, as you start to work with it, just use caution and then maybe teach us what you find as well. Okay, so I'm just going around the edges, making sure that I fully load where any of the fungus gnats can be. Plus these greens in here, that's gonna be some nice green, fresh nitrogen. All right, one more. Okay, that looks like we did the job. I'm gonna work that in with my hands and then I can come in behind and actually use the water can to make sure this is fully activated and glued to the soil and starts to do its job, but I can smell it in the air. The glucosinolate that's in here is actually a health compound for, you know, it's been part of human medicine for a long time, similar to a lot of the build soil products. As goes human health, so plant and soil health, and there's a lot of similarities and trade-offs there. 
good to see. Okay, the rest will get worked in by the water. That looks great. I'd like to treat all the soil in here. So I'm gonna put some, lastly, on the bed of coot soil. I need to show you doing that. I'm just gonna sprinkle some of this mustard seed meal across the bed there. That's it. I mean, I could have added a tiny bit of calcium in here, but we'll probably add a little bit more as we go. Micronutrients, like I mentioned, I'm gonna use the C90 or I'll use the big six. And that's it. If you've got questions, we covered a lot of ground today. I mean, I'm talking breaking cover crop down and using a new mustard seed meal that we've never talked about and doing soil testing and my free soil test calculator. So if you've got questions, put them in here. We'll answer them. You can reach out to our staff. If you like this content, tell us about it. If you want us to go deeper on all the math and soil testing and really go all the way, let us know. We'll consider doing a special episode on it. We've threatened in the past, but if you guys really want that stuff, we'll follow through. Um, if you want the spreadsheet that you've seen here, go to our blog and you can look for it there. It's free to download, it's open source, take the info. We've got a free book for download on aloe vera now we just added. So check back there as a resource. Otherwise, like always, put your comments in here, ask questions, subscribe, hit the like button, tell your friends, and we'll see you on the next episode.